الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وارحم على عبدك ورسولك سيدنا محمد النبي الامي كما صليت وباركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد الحمد لله ويف كروست اولموست ريتشت ار ابوت تو كروست هاف اوف ذا مانث اوف رمضان اند اول اوف اس نو ويل اند وي هاد اولسو ريفلكتد ات ذا ستارت اوف ذا مانث اوف رمضان that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Qur'an, Shahr al-Ramadhan al-Ladhi unzili fi al-Qur'an, that the month of Ramadhan is the month in which the Qur'an al-Kareem was revealed. One aspect of that is that every verse of Qur'an al-Kareem was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Ramadhan, and I already explained uh, one sense of that meaning, that it was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unto the Allah al-Mahfuz, the eternally preserved tablet. There's another aspect of Qur'an al-Kareem. And that's a little bit tricky, uh, but I think it's if it's properly understood, it is one of the most incredible and amazing teachings of our deen, uh, and something that no other deen has ever claimed to the best of my knowledge. And neither Judaism or Christianity have anything like it in their tradition. And that is that Qur'an al-Kareem is Kalamullah, is the Kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, speech in English doesn't do anywhere near understanding, you know, doesn't anywhere near express the term Kalam. It is the speech, the discourse, the communication of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is Al-Mutakallim. And just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is pre-eternal, just like that his kalam is pre-eternal. So in the simplest way to express this in English is in the, exactly the same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always existed. His that, his essence, his being has always existed, has always had wujud. Just like that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was always all of his names and attributes he was always al-mutakallim because that is intrinsic and essential to his very being and nature and therefore he is always in a way that me and you cannot understand and this is the important part in a ways in not a way in infinite ways that me and you can infinitely not understand in infinite ways that me and you can infinitely not understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been expressing that kalam, even before there were letters, even before there were vowels, even before there was sound, even before there was a language created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Arabic. He was always expressing that. Allah wa what that means. It is with ma'na in meaning and with love, but we don't cannot understand a higher understanding of the meaning word beyond what me and you know to be word that is it means it is expressed in a language such as Arabic with letters and sounds and recitations etc. Now what does that mean? We know from Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam that Surah Al-Fatiha is Ummul Kitab is the mother of the Quran. What does that mean? And this is also this this itself hadith by the way I think should be included in hadith collections on motherhood. 
right? Because a woman should think that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the rank or maqam of being an um, of being a mother, it's the same word. Allah ta'ala gave me the same title because he's giving me the same rank in humanity. The same title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Surah Al-Fatiha in the Quran and the same rank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Surah Al-Fatiha in the Quran by using the word um. Allahu Akbar. This single hadith itself, if you ask me, is even more uh, about the sha'an of a mother than the more often quoted and widely known and authentic hadith that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said that paradise lies at the feet of your mother of your um. So now let's take Surah Al-Fatiha, Umm Al-Kitab, Umm Al-Quran. And let's just take the first line from that to start with Alhamdulillah. It means that from the very essence of Allah Ta'ala's being and existence, He has always been praising Himself as He Himself alone is worthy of being praised and as He Himself alone is capable praising His praiseworthiness. Alhamdulillah. Allah Akbar. And then he decided, since past eternity, to reveal to us and to share with us that we should also praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should praise that being who is infinitely, uniquely praiseworthy and who has been pre-eternally, infinitely praising himself as he is infinitely praiseworthy that you and me, mortal human beings, we should also praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a manner and say, Alhamdulillah. And that saying of Alhamdulillah will begin will be the beginning, Fatiha, the opening of the Qur'an al-Kareem, of Allah ta'ala's kalam. And that saying of Alhamdulillah will be the beginning and the opening, the Fatiha of our Salah. And this is just Alhamdulillah. And the reason I'm talking about Surah Al-Fatiha in today, our first Ramadan reflection, is that because when you're in the month of Ramadan and fasting, it is a very good opportunity to work on the other pillars of Islam. So Saum, the fast, is a pillar of Islam. Salah is a pillar of Islam. A fundamental aspect of the Salah, the core, the pinnacle aspect of Salah, is the recitation, Irat al-Qur'an, in the Qiyam. And it's interesting that the ulama discuss this, that what is the greatest, the most virtuous, the most praiseworthy, what they call the abdal, the abdal aspect of salah. And they had two positions. One was that it is Qiyam, and the second that it is sujood. So the first position, opinion, option, is that it's Qiyam when you're standing. But you have to understand, it's not talking about just a physical position of standing. The reason why Qiyam, standing, was selected was because Qiyam is that posture in which you do Qirat al-Qur'an, in which you recite Qur'an al-Kareem. So actually the real position, the, the a better way to express and phrase the, that position is the greatest aspect of Salah is the recitation of Qur'an when standing in Salah. right? And it's something to reflect upon that there is no recitation of Qur'an so to speak, in terms of ayat, right, in ruku and in sujood. The second position, and, and, and many of you would already know this, is that the second position that ulama took was that the abdul, or the greatest and most virtuous position and posture and state or aspect of salah is sujood, right? Because the sujood, the sajda, the prostration is viewed as the pinnacle and the apex of the Salah, the ultimate expression of one's humility, submission, subordination, and also the place of Qurb, where a place a person feels that most intimate nearness. In fact, the reality is, is that sujood, such the prostration, would hands down unanimously have been the winner. It's just missing one thing, but a very important thing. And what is that? Qira'at al-Qur'an. Qira'a, recitation of Qur'an, of Kalamullah. Hmm? Allah Akbar. So, when we are in the state of fasting, because that is a far the pillar of Islam, we should also reflect as much as we can on the far 
pillar of salah. And because, alhamdulillah, we're in a state of obedience by just committing that act of obedience of keeping the fast, when you're obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you naturally are able to feel more dhikr, more remembrance of Him, more huzur, more presence of heart and mind inside the salah. So, and all of us, I think, would have experienced this, that the quality of our salah in Ramadan is better than the quality of our salah outside Ramadan. But this is an incredible opportunity that we should try to make our salah even better. It's passively sort of better by default because of the fast. Imagine how much better the salah would be if we also consciously tried to make an effort to improve our salah. And the first way to do that is to reflect on Surah Al-Fatiha. So hence I think that Surah Al-Fatiha in this sense, in terms of our own practical spiritual development, is an important thing to focus on in Ramadan. But the other thing, which is what I've been talking about since the beginning, is that Ramadan is the month of Qur'an. Surah Fatiha is the ultimate essence, lub, heart, right? Although technically that has been used for Surah Yasin, but in a general sense, being the mother of the Qur'an, it's also the heart of the Qur'an, the essence of the Qur'an. And if Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an, then you could in that sense now say that Ramadan is the month of Surah Al-Fatiha. Right? Only saying it in the way that we have explained it. Alright. So Surah Al-Fatiha begin, begins with Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So infinite praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that being who is infinitely praiseworthy. That being who is infinitely praiseworthy and has been infinitely praising himself since past eternity, as only he is infinitely capable of praising himself. That's the full English translation of Alhamdulillah. Hmm? Allah Akbar. You can't just think, praise be to Allah, or praise be to God, right? Just compare this, praise be to God, and the whole sentence, two or three sentences that I gave you. You have to go deep into the meaning, deep into the meaning. And then understand that what, who are we? What are, who are we to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we even have that capacity? Because normally to praise something, a being, anything, any being, anything, you should know about it, right? So if I want to praise someone, let's say I want to praise somebody's cooking. Well, I should know their cooking and be familiar with their cooking and have tasted their cooking in order to praise their cooking. Here's a different type of hamd. And, it, it, and again, if you look at this at the beginning, although often, obviously, when we recite Surah Fatah and Salah, we already are aware of Qur'an, but in the way that Allah SWT has chosen to reveal to Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to sequence the Qur'an, Alhamdulillah comes at the very start. So actually what we're saying is that, Ya Allah, it's almost as if we're saying, it's not literally true because most of us have read Qur'an, right? But what we're saying is Allah SWT, even without reading a single letter or word of Qur'an yet, alright? Even without even reading the Qur'an yet, already I know to begin with this beginning, Alhamdulillah, that all infinite praise is to you as you are infinitely praiseworthy. Now imagine if that's the feeling of a person's heart, Alhamd, before they even recite or learn or aware or read or hear Qur'an al -Kareem. Imagine the level of hum they would reach by the end of the Qur'an. So let's start because that I can't do that for you right now in the short Ramadan reflection. But let's start with how much a person will reach the height of hamd when they end Surah Fatiha. Hmm? So Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So wh what is this now? You would think Allah should say Rabbil Quran or Rabbil Islam or maybe even Rabbil Nas. So you have to imagine that when not imagine, you have to understand, conceptualize that when we say the Quran is Kalamullah, when Kalam means speech, communication, Allah SWT, it's like the voice of Allah SWT, so to speak, right? So this, this communication, this voice that is coming to us, this Kalam is not coming from a void, it's not coming just from Jibreel salam revealing Quran, reciting Quran to the Prophet Muhammad it is coming from Rabb, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Rabb, our Rabb, the Rabb of all of the Alameen. So this is an expression of the vastness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rububiyyah. The vastness of His, so Rabb means His nurturing, sustaining, cherishing, caretaking attribute. And that being who is infinitely praiseworthy and who is the Rabb of all all of the alameen is addressing me and asking me to address him and recite these verses of his kalam to him. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Right? So now this is the first introduction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is the all merciful the being who possesses all mercy and Ar-Rahim, the being who sends all mercy. And there are many ways to look at the distinction and differentiation between Rahman and Rahim, but there's just one that we're going to use. Now, again, think of this in all the different ways. So number one, Allah SWT is telling me about Himself that He is Ar-Rahman and Rahim. Allah Taala wants me to address Him and declare this aspect about him that he is a Rahman a Rahim. Allah SWT wants this because it's Fatiha to be the whole tone and tenor of the Quran. And Allah SWT wants these attributes of his, because it's Surah Al Fatiha, to set the whole tone and tenor of our Salah, a pillar of deen. That Allah SWT is all merciful and expresses all that mercy. Now, why is this important? Because remember, the way I've explained Fatiha to this point is this notion that Allah SWT is transcendent. He's above our imagination, above our conceptualization, right? And there are many aspects of Allah SWT that He does not disclose and reveal and share entirely on humanity or on believers. But when Allah SWT said, Ar-Rahman ar rahim and if we understand Ar-Rahman to be the being of infinite mercy, limitless mercy, boundless mercy, the being of mercy itself, mercy incarnate, the ep epitome of mercy. If we had just stopped at Ar-Rahman, we would have thought, well, just like everything else about Allah SWT has a mysterious element, al batin element, uh, element that will not be disclosed, will not be shared, is sublime, is latif. But when Allah Taala said Ar-Rahim, what he showed, told us is as far, and as far as Allah tells that, his essence and being, it is beyond our understanding. There will be many aspects of it that are latif, sublime, will not be disclosed, shared, revealed. But as far as his mercy, there will be nothing that's withheld. His ghadab, his anger is withheld. That's another attribute of his, but that's withheld through his hilm, his tahammul, his halim. But when it comes to his rahma, his ar-Rahman, nothing will be withheld. All the infinite, limitless, boundless mercy that He Himself is and is the epitome of Ar-Rahman, all of that mercy in its entirety, Ar-Rahim, will be showered and poured down on humanity. Some in this life, some on the Day of Judgment, and the rest of it throughout future eternity in the Akhirah. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Okay Alhamdulillahi Rabbin Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Now if you look at this word Malik Right And those of you who know the Quranic orthography The consonantal skeleton of Quran These are fancy words The Rasm Al-Khat Right the, When you look at the ink the inked inscription of Kalamullah, and some of you may know this, this can be read Malik and Malik, Master and King. And both meanings are intended here. So immediately, Allah Ta'ala puts us in a relationship that He is our Master, and we are His slaves, right? He is our Master and we are slaves. But then, that if you just look at the word Malik, but when you look at Yom ad Malik, that he is the king of that day. Now why is that important? That's important because 
you know, like if there's a day, it's a day of deen, but you know that people translate it as Yom al is the day of judgment, the day of recompense. There's different ways of justice, right? So there's a judge. If Allah Ta'ala said he was the Qadi of Yom al he was the judge of the day of judgment, right? But a judge is by very nature going to decide purely and exclusively on the basis of justice. But the king has the right to decide in any way he wants. So, for example, there's a court and there's justice. The judge is going to, by definition, apply the law and he must pass the sentence according to fair judgment, but he has to pass that sentence. The king, even in this world, right, the king can pardon, executive pardon, executive authority. That's the nature of the king. The king is not bound by anything. It doesn't mean the king is unjust. The king can be perfectly just and also not be bound by justice. And that is the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, his, that's the nature of his might and his majesty. And that is the attribute he will have on the Day of Judgment. And the reality is if actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, and this is a mistake that the Mu'tazila did and some modernists also today, they take this word justice and think that justice is the greatest thing and the greatest thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than justice. His mercy is greater than His justice. His being Malik, His Mulukiya, His mastery and His kingship is even transcends and is greater than His justice. Because the reality is if He was to be just, purely just with us on the Day of Judgment, 99.99% of us, if not 100% of it except for the Anbiya, would all go to Jahannam. Right? We'd all be sentenced to punishment. So it's because he's the king, Malik, and he has complete mastery, Malik, and he has Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim of absolute mercy, dispensing that absolute mercy, do we have any hope in salvation and in our future in the Akhirah? So here now we have just done what? Alhamdulillah, right? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm And you can see, even if we can just try in this month of Ramadan, inside our Salah, to focus on this Surah Al-Fatiha, and try to recite it more from the heart, and with more feeling, inshallah it will make a huge difference in our experience in this month of Ramadan, and I think it's especially important, especially when we're in the middle of the month, where a lot of people feel sometimes you get this mid-Ramadan slump, you don't have that energy and passion in the first few days, and you haven't yet, we haven't yet reached the last 10 days. And so if a person maybe is feeling a little bit of a lapse or a decline in extra ibadat or a'mal, or they feel I'm not doing as much as I could or I should or I wish I would in Ramadan or they're comparing themselves to previous years and better times maybe perhaps they were in better times in previous years Allah Ta'ala give them more tawfiq alright let's say you're in that situation but right now definitely what you are certainly doing is praying your salah right maybe you're not able to recite extra Quran or do so many extra things or extra acts of worship or service or virtue or character whatever you had planned and wished and sincerely intended to do and may Allah Ta'ala inshallah accept everybody's niyyah but one thing that we are definitely doing obviously in Ramadan is our salah so if you ever find yourself in that situation that you're not doing more whatever it is that you're doing try to do that better and obviously as I've said that we should try to increase our Salat and focus on Surat Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Malik Yawm al-Din Iyaka na'budu wa Iyaka nasta'een Alright After Malik Yawm al-Din 
The next sentence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us to say in Surah Al-Fatiha in Quran in our Salah is إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَهِينَ So this is the reply to everything that has come before it. This is the natural, true, human response. Any human being who knows now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His eternal, pre-eternal, infinite, perfect, wondrous existence has addressed that human being through His infinite, eternal, pre-eternal, infinitely beautiful and perfect kalam and speech and address and then has taught that human being in the course of that address and as part of that kalam and that speech has taught that human being what? That, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, bin Adameen, Ar Rahman Rahim, Malik Yomidin, then any human being at that moment is going to say from the depth and bottom of their heart, Iyaka na'budu, that you and you alone. That's it. Even just the Iyaka is enough to understand. Even before we explain, right? And I think we often. You know, those of us for whom maybe Arab is, Arabic is not our native language, we skip over things like iyaka and oh. we skip over things like okay, we're back. I think we skip over iyaka. We skip over iyaka. Right? And we move, we, we skip over these prepositions and these, you know, pronouns. But this itself is extreme. The word iyaka is an incredibly intense. And I think this is one of the words that I felt also when I was trying to analyze my Surah Al-Fatiha and reflect my own recitation of that, is that this is something that we fly over, iyaka. So actually, iyaka means you alone, you only, right? That itself, this... I'm not saying that you should do it, and I'm not trying to launch a new type of dhikr, but I'm actually amazed that no Sufi in history ever came up with this dhikr, just to say, Iyaka, Iyya, maybe someone, Allah, probably, probably did actually, but this itself is just amazing, Iyaka, even if you, if you just stop there, so what would it mean? Infinite praise to that being who is infinitely praiseworthy, the Lord, cherisher, sustainer, nourisher of all of the realms of creation, the being of infinite mercy who showers that infinite mercy infinitely, the master and king of the day of judgment, and then your response to that is just you only. Iyaka. That's it now. My whole life is just for you now. My whole being is just for you only. My heart now is for you only. My mind now is for you only. My orientation now is for you only. I look at this earth and sky and the heavens and I reflect on the universe and I think everything is just for you only. I look at my own little life, my issues, my problems, my goals, my desires, my plans. I realize all of that has to be for you only. Iyaka, Iyaka, Iyaka. And then when you come to this state, and this is required, you have to negate yourself. When you come to this state where you erase everything, negate everything, you become free and empty and liberated from everything, then there's only one thing left in you. There's only thing, one thing left in your humanity. Na'budu. The only one thing left is your ibadah. That's who you are. You strip yourself of every all these other fancy notions, ideas, identities, markers, categories, groupings, right? And you realize, iyaka, it's about Allah Ta'ala, it's about you only. Na'budu. All of us, we just worship you. That's it. And in some sense, really, that's what Jannah is. It doesn't mean in Jannah, you are all the time making sajda, or all the time doing formal ibadah. But in Jannah, a human being, Insha'Allah, may Allah Ta'ala admit us into Jannah from His infinite rahmah and mercy. In Jannah, a human being is eternally simply existing in a state of ubudiyah and ibadah, in a state of worshipful, 
servanthood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our asal. Right? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. That's the true human existence. And really, if, you know, when people, you know, modernists, etc. talk about humanity, if you want to understand humanity, why do you want to understand humanity on the basis of that one second in the lifespan, lifespan of humanity, which is called the dunya? Why don't you understand what humanity really is based on that infinite time period humanity is going to live in akhirah? And if you really want to understand what noble and perfect humanity is, it's not going to be based on any type of metric in this world, but what you have to understand is what type of human are the Ahlul Jannah, the people of Jannah. And they will be people who are in a state of eternal na'budu, that all of the Ahlul Jannah are simply worshipping, or in a state of worship, or in a hal, a kaif, a feeling, of worshipfulness for all eternity. Now that state of the people of Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought us to that state in just a few ayahs of Surah Al-Fatiha. In other words, all that is required in a human being to create that state of ibad and ubudi of worshipful servanthood, worshipfulness and slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simply this Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm din That's it. That's enough to bring a person to Iyaka. That's enough to bring a person to Na'budu. Alright. Now when a person has reached the state Iyaka Na'budu that you alone and you only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we worship. Okay, it's almost like I, I sometimes I would describe it this way, like this is the open your eyes moment in Surah Al Fatiha. Is it open your eyes and now look at your reality? So like up till now this was like a transcendent. Transcendent is just a fancy word. It means you were just you you were above and beyond your own circumstances, your own self. And now you open your eyes, right? And you look at your life and you look at your struggles and you look at your nafs and you look at your failings, you look at your constraints, you look at your circumstances, you have this, oh, Allah Akbar, big opening, realization moment. That this is, this is it was a wonderful up to here, and yes, that's Jannah, but I'm in dunya. So, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, and I'm going to need your help. Right? You and you only, you and you alone, Will we seek help? So what happened between Iyak and Abudu and Iyak and Nasta'in? A feeling of helplessness. A feeling of helplessness in what? In terms of some worldly illness? No, no. A feeling of helplessness in how am I going to do Na'budu? How am I going to be the true worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Me, given who I am, and my personality, and my condition, and my state, and my sins, and my weaknesses, and my flaws. Okay, so in that state of helplessness, another major teaching of Surah Al-Fatiha, is in the state of extreme helplessness, or all the way from a small helplessness, like Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi beautifully taught, that even if a person's toe strap or shoelace snaps, they should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Akbar. I mean, that's, that, that's just a metaphor. I mean, Sayyidina Rasulullah, he meant it literally also. Literally that happens to someone. But it's also symbolic of anything. If you have even the slightest, most minor, tiniest of setbacks in the dunya, you will turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if you have the greatest setback and difficulty in the dunya, that you're struggling to do ibadah, and worship and obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything in between this most minor and most major setback that you and you alone and you only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nasta'in will we turn to right? will we turn to seeking help your own own means the madad and nusrat the help, assistance, succor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all right. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm Al-Din, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'in, Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen. 
Okay, so you, you had your eye-opening moment. You realize that I'm weak. I turn to Allah Ta'ala for help. And now you get back up, right? Now you the first step out of the helplessness. You were helpless. You said, Iyak and Asta'in. Now you come out of that helplessness. You take the first step. You want to place that first step on a path. What does this mean? Ihdina Salat al-Mustaqeem. Allah Ta'ala is creating in us teaching us that we must realize in ourselves a desire to make movement, to make progress. Once He has given us this direction, this muqsood, this goal and purpose of iyak and a'budu, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Him, you alone are now our purpose in life. We want to move now. We, there's no time. We must immediately get going. right? Just think like when you travel, like we need to hit the highway. That's what it means. Now there's no pause now. There's no waiting. There's no delaying. There's no analyzing. There's no intellectualizing. This is enough. This is enough information for us. Is enough information for us. You alone we seek help. Put us on that path. Guide us on that path. Guide us on that way. Push us along that way. Bring us deeper and deeper and further and further on that way. Which way? As-sirat. So how is Allah SWT going to do this? Allah SWT is not going to do it through His qadr or His jabr or His power or His force. He's not going to force us. He's not going to do it for us. Hidayah, hidayah, ihdina, hidayah. He's going to give us guidance. Right? And just like, and what, what, what type of guidance? More Qur'an. More teachings from Sahib al-Qur'an, Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa More feelings that have come in my heart, just like these feelings came from Alhamdulillah, Rabbin Adameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahman, Maliki, Umadeen. So there's immediately a realization. No, no, Allah is not going to work miracles in your life. He's not going to intervene in this world and prevent evil. It's about hidayah. It's about Hidayah. He will give you Hidayah. He will give you guidance. He will give you inspiration. He will give you knowledge. Quran al Kareem. He will give you exemplar of that knowledge. Sayyidina Rasul al Kareem. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will give you Hidayah. He will put in your heart feelings of love for Him. He will put in your heart feelings of fear for Him. He will give you Hidayah. He will give you a fitra, an aql, a kalb, a ruh. He will give you Hidayah. And this is what we want. So it means that every single aspect then of this guidance is for a purpose. And that's why it's very dangerous if, if you learn knowledge and don't practice it. That means it's not Hidayah. Why? Because if you didn't practice it, it didn't move you on Salat al -Mustaqim. It's only Hidayah when it moves you further along. In the first instance, if you're wayward, it brings you back Towards Surat al Mustaqim. It brings you back onto Surat al Mustaqim. It moves you forward on Surat al Mustaqim. Indina Surat al Mustaqim. Right? And this, this is a path. This is not a path that me and you could come up with. Right? No matter how and inshallah, whenever inshallah we manage to do that. <laughs> we prepared a lot for that, but whenever we manage to finally have the himma and strength to deliver that for you. This path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be one only entirely exclusively human reason because human reason can never come up with a completely mustaqeem path. Human reason is itself flawed. If nothing else, it's limited. That limit itself is a flaw. Even if it's correct, it's still limited. Even when, even when it is correct, it is still limited. In fact, much of the philosophy of mathematics and philosophy of science teaches a person that. All right. Khair. So, Indina Sirat al Mustaqim. A Sirat al Mustaqim. There's also a t attesting to something Allah is going to say himself later, right? Just a few verses down at the start of Surah al Baqarah, Dalik al Kitabu. Dalik al Kitabu, La Rebafi. Obviously, because the Sirat is Mustaqeem, so the book that's going to guide us on that path, there can be no rape, there can be no doubt in it. But he, what it means here is 
that there is no skeptical obscurity type of doubt that can lead a person astray. Okay. So, as-sirat al-mustaqeem. Ya Allah Ta'ala, guide us, grant us hidayah on that straight and perfect path that will take us, lead us to you. Right? So, what, what happened? Because, you know, when you opened your eyes, you saw your dunya, you saw your circumstances, so you said, Iyak and Asta'in, and then you saw the rest of your future life on earth. In the sunset, there's a lot of time. <laughs> ya Allah, if you took me right now in this moment, if you took me in Ramadan, in Salatul Asr, in Qiyam, when I'm reciting Surah Fatiha to you, and when I say, Iyya cannot do, you take my Ruh, everything is good. Right? But when you, but now, when you say, Iyya cannot and you realize, that no, there's a whole life I have yet to live. <laughs> and it's very important now, I'll give you general teaching. So yes, Ramadan comes, you get a spiritual high, you still got a whole life left to live. It's very important, Ramadan, to make du'as for Allah Ta'ala for my life. Ya Allah, Allah, give me a life on Qur'an. Ya Allah, Allah, you're giving me a day of obedience. I'm fasting for you in your name and for your sake. Give me a life of obedience. Give me a life of salah. Give me a life of ibadah. Give me a life of taqwa. Give me a life of du'a. I'm doing all these things instantaneous at the moment, right? But I need a life on this. I need a life all the way. On the one hand, on the one hand, the Salat ends in terms of our traveling on that path ends at Malt, right? When we die. And this is a major thing also for us to understand. That in that sense, that Salat has an end, which is called our Qabr, which is Malt, our death, right? And when you cross the finish line, you end up in a grave. And that's it then. There's no chance to practice more Hidayah. It's all over. So let's say you know so much Qur'an and you don't practice it until you die. There's no chance after you die to practice it. And I think Ramadan also is it, it I think it's made us very time conscious. We all know this, that Ramadan is going to end. Just like as aware and conscious you and me are that Ramadan is going to end, right? We should be equally, in fact, more conscious it's not just Ramadan that is Ayamu Ma'dudat. It's my life that is Ayamu Ma'dudat. It is my life that is limited in numer days. And my life is going to end. And all the things that we think about, oh, I, I, I want to, inshallah, try to get this done and do that and finish my recitation of Quran and etc. before Ramadan ends. Think about all the things that we should want to do before our life ends. al-mustaqim. <laughs> I like to think, and you know this, not, I'm just sort of also sharing with you personally, the way I encounter and experience and recite Surah Al-Fatiha, that this is actually, when a person recites this part, you know, and I'm changing a very, in a very important but maybe subtle way, ways that I myself may have explained this next verse in the past, although those explanations are correct, uh, because they were from the Islamic scholarly tradition. I'm not trying to negate anyone who adheres to those explanations, but I'm going to take it in a different direction today. Normally, when people comment on this verse, Surat al Amtalehim, right, the path of those whom Allah SWT has blessed, it's normally understood as it rightly should be in light of another verse of Quran al Karim where Allah SWT mentions Al Ladina an Amallahu Alehim. That they are people whom Allah Ta'ala has blessed and they are from and among the Nabiin, the Prophets and Messengers, alayhi wasallam ajma'in, the Siddiqeen, the true, the truest followers who are the embodiments of the truth of the Prophets and followed them so truly. The Shuhada, those who were martyrs and were willing to give their very life for Deen and Salihin, the virtuous, upright, noble uh, believers. All right. But now, if you look at it, and sometimes that there is that element in the Quran that Allah Subhanahu wa has deliberately ordered in a sequence. So, if you look at it from that sense, at this stage in the recitation, especially for those of us who aren't Sahaba and did not receive the Qur'an piecemeal over 22 years, hear it from the Prophet Muhammad and do not first encounter the revelation 
in the chronological order that was revealed, but you and me and all of us and the entire ummah and all the tabi'in until the end of time encountered the Quranic revelation, Kalamullah, Quran al Karim, Kitabullah, in the way that Allah SWT revealed Nabi Kareem Sallallahu to arrange and order it. So right now at this point in the recitation of Quran at Surah Al-Fatiha and because Surah Al-Fatiha also has the depth and strength to stand alone on its own, we do not actually know that the Allah Anamta Alayhim are the Nabi and Sindikin Shahada and Salihim. Right? Okay, let me explain this in a way that so you don't misunderstand. So let's put it this way. In one sense you do know, because obviously Tafsir al Quran bil Quran. But in one sense, you can even imagine a feeling of reciting this verse without knowing. And that's what I'm going to share with you. All right. So you're making dua. We're making dua. Ya Allah, guide us on the straight path. Now there's a hope without yet knowing, maybe, right? For some of us, certainly when I first studied Surah Al-Fatiha, I had no idea about that other verse, right? So at this moment, another feeling that could be there. So for those who know, the feeling is that Ya Allah make us emulate and follow the path of the, not just the Sunnah of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but the path of all the Nabiin, not just the path of Nabiin, but our deen teaches us also. We are a deen of Siddiqeen, a deen of Shuhada, and a deen of Salihin, and therefore we follow people. So that feeling is there, if you know that, other part, other verse of Quran. But if someone doesn't know that other verse of Quran, there's another feeling that will still stay even after you, after you know that verse. Okay, so I think I've explained this enough. That feeling. That feeling is, okay, look, that, Ya Allah, there have to be some people who you guide in such a way that you guide them in such a way, you guide them in such a way that you are actually pleased with them. There have to be some people that you bless in such a way that they actually pull it off. What? Not will do. They actually pull off this mission of ubudiyah and ibadah. So, Idina Salat al Mustaqim, Salat al Ladina an Amta alayhim. Ya Allah, guide me to the path of those upon whom you have showered your blessings. Right? So, in other words, there's a hope there. What I'm trying to say is that there's a hope that I may also be someone. When I'm making this plea to Allah Ta'ala, إِذِنَ صَلَاتُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ That I may also be someone who is rightly guided. And then yes, then that basic desire to be rightly guided then must be immediately connected to how Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an explains this verse that to be rightly guided you have to be connected to, emulate, Follow the footsteps of, put your footsteps in the footprints of the Nabiin, Siddiqeen, Shuhada, and Salihin. And when you realize that and you say that, then the feeling that a person gets, it's not just their own solitary journey, but this is a tradition, right? And this is a tradition of humanity going back to Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. Alright, Mustaqim, so now what happened when we realize it was a tradition of humanity and now you look back on humanity. So I'm sort of explaining this to you as if you're having these feelings but what I'm really explaining to you is that Allah SWT revealed Quran, every part of Quran and Surah Fatah to inspire feelings. So I'm giving one sample of what possible feelings could be inspired. All right? And all of you should try to feel whether these feelings or other feelings, but the point is to be inspired and to feel the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Right? Okay. That yes, Allah Ta'ala is calling our attention to the fact that yes, you don't understood, you don't want to be on it alone. Right? You, sh you should understand that you do not want to be on it alone. You should know that this is the path, that there have been people who Allah Ta'ala has blessed who have been on this path, but you should also know once your gaze turns to humanity, and yes, your gaze falls upon the Nabi and Siddiqui and Shohada and Salihin, once your gaze turns to humanity, your gaze should also know that there's another, there are other types of humanity. Who are they? They're the Maghdubi alayhim and the Dalin. 
those human beings who have incurred the anger and wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those human beings who are haplessly, hopelessly, willfully astray. Any one of those, right? They may be ha haplessly astray, they may be willfully astray. And you should be wary. And this, this is where Surah Al Fatiha ends, right? So it ends on this notion of wariness, watchfulness, that I don't want to connect myself to them, I don't want to emulate them, I don't want to put my footprints in the footsteps of those whom Allah Ta'ala is angry with and who are astray. This is the feeling that it ends on, that we're supposed to have, right? And I don't myself ever want to be of them. Just as much as I want to be from the Salihin, right? Let's start with the basic level of the Alladheen Anam Talehim that Allah does mention in the Quran. As much as I would want to be from the Salihin, as much I should not want and be wary and careful of being from those whom Allah Ta'ala is angry with or astray. And now going back to the first word of this passage, Ihdina. So you can understand that all of this is what equals Hidayah. Hidayah means to be guided to the Nabiin. Hidayah also means to be guided to the Siddiqeen. Hidayah also means to be guided by the Shuhada. Hidayah also means to be guided by the Salihin. Hidayah also means to not be influenced by or inspired by the Maghlubi alayhim. And there are some people who may have, and the moderns don't understand this either, that there are some people who may have certain, in a certain sense, certain virtuous traits, but they have a foulness in their beliefs about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has made them maghlubi alayhim. And therefore we shall not be inspired by them generally about how to live life, and we shall certainly not be inspired by them as to how to interpret and understand our religion. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Just like that, there's also another category of people who are andalin, and the ulama of tafsir have really, obviously, you know, talked so much about Surah, have written so much about Surah Al Fatiha. But one notion is that there are andalin, if you take these two in the sense of mughayra, if you contrast them, and that they're distinct and differentiated from one another, that means there are some people who are astray. Allah is not angry with them. They're not maghlubi alayhim. They're just dalin. Obviously, there are people who are both. But there's a notion here that there are also some people who are just dalin, that they're astray. Allah is not angry with them. But, ihdina, it's against hidayah for me to follow them. Now, this covers all <laughs> the remaining sort of inspires of modernists, right? Because there are many human beings who actually Allah is not angry with them. But they're astray because they're not upon the Quran, Sunnah, and Sharia. They're astray. And you and you can, Hidayah cannot consist of following them, let alone trying to reinterpret and reform, right? And even if you claim that that is in order to revive and maybe you're sincere but misguided in that understanding, if you think you're going to reform and reinterpret and revive Islam on the basis of understandings developed and espoused by Adalin, it's not Hidayah. It may be, it may, may be modernist Islam, it's not going to be Hidayah. Hidayah comes from the Hidayah come into the in that aspect of Hidayah that comes from being inspired by other members of humanity will only come from those members of humanity who are called Nabiyin, Siddiqin, Shuhada, and Salihin. So, going back to our Salah, because I actually, I, I, I explained Surah Fatah a bit more than I intended to. Don't, you're not going to, don't try to think all these things inside Salah. Definitely don't even think the word modernist or these type of things inside Salah. Inside Salah, it's just Talab Hidayah. Talab Hidayah, that's all from Ihdin Salat al Mustaqim all the way to the end. The feeling you want in your heart is a desire for Hidayah, a desire to be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a desire to be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and a plea to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from ever being from those whom He is angry with and those who are astray, and to protect us from ever, ever being inspired by or inclined towards those who 
he is angry with or those who are astray. But really, if you ask me, it all goes back to Alhamdulillah. And maybe I'll mention that a little bit, why not a little bit more, uh, is that, you know, there's also a way to feel Surah Fatiha, which is not mm, so tied to the specific explanations of the specific words that are in tafsir or what I offered and shared today. It's just this feeling. So now let's take out the big, big feeling. Just the feeling of hamd, your hamd for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The feeling of Allah ta'ala's rahmah, ar-Rahman rahim The feeling of Allah ta'ala being malik and malik, master and king. The feeling of na'budu, that you want to be in a state of ibadah. The feeling of helplessness and hope that he will help you, nasta'een. The feeling of talab, hid, desiring of hidayah. The feeling of yaqeen that hidayah exists because an'amta alayhim, that there are people whom Allah, Allah has guided. Right? And a feeling of certainty and confidence in Islam, your religion, that it's the path that is mustaqeen. Even if you just have broadly these feelings in the most broad sense, even in a very abstract sense, it doesn't have to be specifically connected and tied to these words and sentences and their meanings. Inshallah, you will feel Fatiha. And the best chance we have to feel Fatiha, for most ordinary people like us, is to feel Fatiha in our Salah, in Ramadan. So may Allah Ta'ala enable us to take advantage of all of the bounties and blessings of Ramadan and use all of that for our Hidayah and to unlock our hearts and unfetter and liberate our hearts from all the worldly and mundane things that we are in. And may Allah Ta'ala guide us and inspire us to turn towards Him more deeply, more sincerely, more penitently in Salah. And may Allah Ta'ala enable us to be more aware and conscious when we recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Wa akhir da'wana. أنا الحمد لله رب العالمين